Rounding issues are probably within the, the top three, top five most common root causes for a lot of medium, high, and critical findings that personally we uncover at Guardian in a lot of our audit reports and of course come up in auditing contests and other reports across the industry. So of course it is critically important to understand, first of all, what is the root cause of all of these different sort of rounding issues? And then second of all, how could you take this and sort of spot issues with rounding in code bases as you're doing your own security reviews in the future? So of course, that's why today we're going to cover everything that you need to know exactly about, you know, what the root cause of all of these rounding issues in Solidity is. And then we're going to have a look at a few different findings and see exactly how this can look different from code base to code base and finding to finding and see the different types of ways that rounding issues can cause issues in a system and then exactly how you can spot those for yourself. All right, but of course, before we get into things today, my name is Owen and over a year and a half ago, almost two years ago at this point, I founded Guardian Audits. And ever since then, our team has uncovered literally over a hundred different critical and high vulnerabilities. And throughout the, the process of doing this, I've personally spent easily over 2000 hours auditing smart contracts. And my goal with this video and all the videos that I create is to distill down everything I've learned from those many, many hours of auditing smart contracts and give it to you so that you can ultimately become a much, much better auditor than I ever could be in a fraction of the time. All right, so with that out of the way, let's dive in and get an understanding of rounding issues. All right, so to start off here, we've got our whiteboard of truth and justice pulled up here and first what we're, we're going to understand is you know why do we have this idea of rounding issues why is it so common throughout code bases to have all sorts of different rounding issues and then of course we're going to understand what are some different ways that this often trips people up and results in findings and then we're going to look at two actual findings which show uh, a different, you know, the different sides of the spectrum of, you know, how these rounding issues can arise and sort of turn into actual findings. So first of all, of course, why do rounding issues exist in Solidity, right? So the, the core reason why we have all these rounding issues is due to truncation, right? So in Solidity, there is no notion of a floating point number or you know something that is able to represent a decimal amount so a non whole number so if i were to to do you know perhaps like 9 divided by 10 well if you do this in python or any other language you're going to end up with 0 0.9 right but in solidity what we're going to end up with is 9 divided by 10 is equal to 0 right and that is because we have truncation division and so instead of being able to to reach back and leverage some decimals here of precision, there's no, there's nothing that we can use to the the right of the decimal here to represent fractions of an amount. And so this is, of course, where we get this fundamental idea of ERC-20 tokens having a decimal, right? So on every ERC-20 token, there's a, a decimals function that will tell you how many uh, decimals are used to represent a atomic unit of that ERC-20 token. And so, of course, we can think of things like wrapped ether, for example, which will have 18 decimals. And so this means that, of course, a 1 followed by 18 zeros or 1 times 10 to the 18, this is equal to 1 equals 1 wrapped ether. Right, and then similarly, of course, we have USDC, which has six decimals. And so for USDC, this means that one times 10 to the sixth is equal to one USDC, right? And so we are artificially creating these decimals to the, the right of the, the decimal spot. We're artificially placing the decimal spot at, you know, for wrapped ETH, 10 to the 18 out, so that we technically have all these other integers to the right of it or you know spots that we can use for precision 
And so if I were to define some token, let's call like USDF or, you know, some made up token, let's say if I defined it to have zero decimals, then what we would end up with is I would have one times 10 to the zero is equal to one USDF. And then if I want to basically portray what is what is 0.5 of a USDF, right? What What is, if I want to do half a USDF, how do you represent that? Well, you literally can't in Solidity, right? So if I did one USDF divided by two USDF or just divided by two, so basically one divided by two, of course, in Solidity, this just equals zero. So there's no way, if I don't have any of these decimals that we've defined, then there's no way for me to basically represent any fraction of a single atomic USDF. But of course, if we wanted to do this for USDC, for example, if I wanted to represent half of a USDC, we can say, so what is one USDC? This is one times 10 to the sixth. We will divide that by two USDC. So two times 10 to the sixth well, we're just going to end up with five times 10 to the fifth, right? So, which is also, you know, you can think of it like 0 0.5 times 10 to the sixth, right? And so that is how we represent half a USDC. And the only reason we're able to do this is of course, because we have defined that an atomic unit of USDC is not one like it is here, but is it, it is in fact one followed by six zeros. So one, zero, 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 zero. That is your one singular USDC. And then just to make it explicitly clear, we have our half of a USDC is five, zero, 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 zero. And that's what half of a USDC looks like. So this is really the, the fundamental reason we have all these rounding issues is because, you know, we just have division using truncation. And so oftentimes if a protocol neglects to implement enough decimals for the calculations that it makes, then they're going to end up with some sort of situation where they are rounding off and they're either not expecting to, or they just don't handle it entirely or you know, perhaps they think it's fine to round off, but in fact it's not, or maybe they even account for some sort of rounding, but then the logic around them trying to account for the rounding occurring is flawed because sometimes it gets hard to think about if you have, for example, negative nine divided by 10, well, this also rounds to zero. Now, in one case, this is rounding up because we went from a negative number to a to zero, this is rounding this is rounding down because we went from you know a positive number to zero and so a lot of times if you have logic that tries to account for the rounding in a way like this usually it ends up having some kind of bug related to you know if a negative number is rounding up positive number rounding down oftentimes it seems to to mess that up and we'll actually see an example of that here in a few minutes so this is really the core of why these rounding issues exist. Now let's have a look at just a, not a critical rounding issue, but a really common issue that you might see in some DeFi protocols. And so here we've got a medium finding pulled up here. It's ORD M9 and it is titled updated average price always rounds down. So of course this is gonna be due to the truncation as you know the crux root cause of this, but given the context of the system, this is not ideal. So we'll just briefly read through this and then we'll discuss what exactly this means and then we'll have a look at the code and understand what the, the remediation for this might be. So the updated average price computed in the increase position function is always rounded down. So what we're dealing with here is we have positions and we have an average price for positions and then we're going to compute PL for that position based on their average price. So for instance, we might have a long position and then the way to compute PL for a long might be such as this. So it would be the current value of the position minus 
the entry value of the position. So did the position increase in value, right? If we bring that down to a more granular level, it would be the position's size in tokens times the current market price minus the position position's size in tokens times the average price. So this is the average entry price, the average entry price for the position. So this is how we're calculating P&L for a long. Now, of course, you can also have a short position in this protocol. And so shorts, we're going to calculate P&L in almost the same way, except what we're going to do is we're going to reverse it, right? So the average value of the position or the entry value of the position minus the current value of the position. So if I'm shorting, I'm expecting the, the token, you know, the size and tokens, the index token, whatever we're trading on to go down in value. And that's how I make profit as a short. So then of course, if we bring that down to a more granular level, what, ha what we have here is the same thing just reversed, right? So there we go. So right here, what we've got is the calculation for the PL. So let's understand how we update when we are increasing a position, we need to change the average entry price. And the average entry price is very critical for determining what is the PL of the position. So let's have a quick look. Okay, so here we are with the increase position function. And the only thing we need to pay attention to here is this computation of the updated average price. So here we're calculating the updated average price based on the existing position's size and the existing position's average price, and we're adding to it the order size and the current execution price. So the amount that we're adding to this position and that sort of value added to what was the position before the value, so we're getting a dollar value here for both of these things, and then we're adding them together, and we are dividing them by the position size plus the order size. So the size of the new position after the increase. And then that way we're getting a total dollar value divided by a token size, and we're getting an average price for the position that will remain after the increase position function. So that's all good and fantastic. This makes sense, except we'll notice the deadly division sign here. So of course, whenever you see a division sign in a system, you should start thinking about a few things. Namely, the first of them obviously being rounding errors. The others might be a divide by zero revert or something like this, but we're gonna focus on rounding errors. So just like we discussed earlier, we have this issue of truncation. So I know that if this numerator here is not exactly divisible by this denominator and maybe there's some remainder that remainder is just going to get left off and not considered in the resulting value so what does this mean this means that i could potentially add an order size and an execution price so add a a value a, a dollar value to my position size without actually updating the average price, as long as the size that I added ends up ultimately rounding off as a remainder when divided by the new size of the position. And so what we would get then is we would be able to, for a long, we would be able to increase the size in tokens, but have the average entry price stay the same, even if I was buying those tokens at a higher price. So it would be almost like if I had previously bought a bunch of tokens when they were priced at $100, and then now when the price is $101, I can buy a ton of tokens at the market price of $101. And if that new addition rounds off, if this order size times execution price is small enough to round off when compared to this denominator here, then it's almost as if I bought all of those new tokens at my previous average price, which is $100. So the, the net effect here is being able to buy some amount of tokens, a small amount of tokens given, but 
at $100 rather than at the current actual market price of $101. So that sounds great, but how, what, <laughs> let's actually walk through it in mathematics, right? So let's, let's have an actual example that we can work through here. So first of all, in the finding, we've got a particular example right here. So when we have a position size, an existing position of 1E18 and an average price of 100E8. So we have this existing position. So we've got position and it has a size. So here's the details of the position as a size, an existing size of 100E18, or sorry, 1E18. And then we've got an average price of 100. And the price is, in this particular system, price has eight decimals. So we've got a price of $100 here, denominated with eight decimals. And then we've got an order size of 1E10. So admittedly, something that is, you know, relatively trivial compared to a size of 1E18, order size of 1E10, and then the execution price, so the price that we are adding this 1E10 at is 101E8. And so we are buying these this 1E10 amount of tokens at a market price of 101, $101, right? So let's walk through the, app, the, the updated average price calculation and see what we end up here with. So first of all, what we do is we do the, the size so that the value of the current position so size times the average price 100e8 that's the size of the current position and then we're going to add to that the size of what we're adding so the value of what we're adding so 1e10 times the execution price of 101e8 now all of that we're going to divide this by the total size of the resulting position that will remain after we do this increased position so we're going to do 1e18 plus 1e10. Okay, great. And this is going to give us our average entry price. So average entry price is equal to, let's see what it is. So we'll pop it into a full precision calculator here. And we can see that we've got dot nine, 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 but solidity don't care about all these nines. Solidity will just give us this 100 e8 here so 100 e8 is the resulting average entry price so i was able to increase the size of my position by 1 e10 and the execution price here had increased from 100 dollars to 101 dollars but that literally did not affect the average price of my position and so of course, this is a somewhat trivial amount comparatively to what the position had in size, but you know, given the right token, it could potentially have a material effect on the system and some malicious actor could be able to leverage this to basically exploit the system and be able to buy tokens at this average price instead of what the current market price actually is. And so the right way to address this is when you have a long which would benefit from doing this sort of rounding down to decrease and basically make the average price stay the same when you have a long instead round up so use round up division and so there are you know you can use like the the popular solidity math library which will have a round up division which will instead of rounding down and doing truncation like this it will round up if there's any remainder and so this way you're making sure to always be giving the trader the slightly you know err on the side of giving them the higher average entry price for a long so that they will have a lower p l and there's no possible way to exploit the system if there is some sort of rounding truncation like this going on. And so of course, that is our recommendation here. It is to use roundup division when calculating the updated average price for longs, and then use that the same truncation round down division when calculating the updated average price for shorts. Because of course, for shorts, if I'm going to be 
decreasing my updated average price relative to what it would be that I'm actually decreasing my P&L. All right, fantastic. So that's one example of how rounding not being accounted for can actually potentially cause issues in a system and potentially lead to some sort of manipulation or gaming of the protocol. Now let's see a different kind of rounding error where team actually looked to account for rounding and, and actually control rounding themselves, but actually encountered some logical errors when they were trying to do that. So let's have a quick look at this finding team app two here, which is titled incorrect tick rounding. So we're going to focus in on this last part, which has to do with the round ahead function. And first of all, to understand what we're doing here, we have to understand this idea of ticks, right? So just to give a brief overview, in this particular protocol, we're using a concentrated liquidity curve. And of course, we know that those have ticks, right? We're going to break up the liquidity curve into discrete tick lengths, and we're gonna have all these different ticks. So what this particular function is doing is for a given position that is either zero for one. So if a trader opens a position from this tick to that tick, and it's if it's zero for one, then it trades this way, then we need to be able to round, like let's say if I had some tick that's not an even tick spacing, a tick of seven, well, I need to be able to round that to either 10 or zero. I need to be able to round that to an actual tick that is divisible by our tick spacing. So rounding ahead for a zero for one position goes to the left here. So round ahead should bring this seven to a 10. However, round ahead for a one for zero position should go this way and it should round this seven to a zero. So depending on the position direction, this tick should round to different ticks that are divisible by the tick spacing. And of course, if all of that sounds like gobbledygook and it doesn't make sense, then be sure to go and check out my video on making Uniswap V3 simple, as simple as possible. And maybe even go and check out the, the AMM complete deep dive video that we have on the channel. And hopefully that should help this make a lot more sense. But really the crux of what this, this function is intended to do is take this seven and bring it to 10 if it is zero for one and bring it to zero if it is one for zero. So let's go ahead and read part of the description here. So the round ahead function implements incorrect tick rounding where zero for one cases where the rounded tick is negative, it is rounded up twice. First, the magnitude of the negative tick is reduced with rounding, and then it is further adjusted up by the tick spacing. And then on the other hand, positive rounded ticks are rounded down and not adjusted up. So let's have a look at this function and understand what we mean here. So here we've got the round ahead function. We can see we're taking in a tick, which can be an integer and the tick spacing as well. And we've got zero for one here. So to indicate which direction this position is trading and which way we should ultimately round because of it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to round the tick. And we're actually using Solidity's truncation as a feature here. So we're doing the tick divided by the tick spacing times the tick spacing. So basically what this will do is if I had 17, for example, 17 divided by 10 as my tick spacing, that is going to equal to one times 10 gives us 10. So I've essentially just rounded off this seven, which wasn't a, you know, it was a remainder when you divide it by 10 due to truncation. So we divide and multiply, get it sort of, you know, snapped on to that divisible rounded tick. And of course, if the rounded tick didn't, literally didn't change anything, then we can just straight up return it. So in this case, if the tick that we were given is 10 and we divide it by 10 and then we multiply by 10, this is of course equal to 10. And then there's no extra considerations here. Now where it gets a little bit tough is where we have this situation of seven is in the middle, right? So let's have a look at what happens. If I were to divide this by 10, then with solidity rounding, I actually get zero. And then I multiply zero by 10, well, that's still zero. Well, we just rounded backwards, right? But for zero for one, we wanna round up to 10. So we've gotta implement some special logic to do that. So for zero for one, if zero for one and the rounded tick 
is less than zero, then we'll take the rounded tick and add the tick space. Well, you might have already noticed, but that doesn't really solve our issue here. So we have an issue where seven needs to go to 10. The rounded tick is exactly equal to zero. So what we need to do is we need to add the tick spacing to that result. But of course, this is not going to do that for us because the rounded tick is exactly equal to zero. It's not less than zero. And so let's see, even if, if let's say we had a tick negative seven, if we want to round ahead, then we want to go from negative seven to zero, right? So let's see what happens here. So our rounded tick is in fact going to be zero, right? So what we have here is negative seven divided by 10, that's equal to zero times 10 equals zero still. And so in that case, we actually do move to zero and there's no adjustment necessary. Well, let's try negative 17. So if negative 10 is there and negative 17 is here, let's see what happens. So we've got negative 17 divided by 10 equals negative one times 10 equals negative 10. This is not true. So we're gonna come here. We are zero for one. The rounded tick is negative. So then we add the tick spacing to the rounded tick. So we already went to negative 10. This was our rounded tick after that first adjustment. Now we're gonna add the tick spacing again. So we're gonna go from negative 10 all the way to zero. So we just rounded negative 17, skipped over the closest full rounded tick and went to zero. So we just increased it up twice. So there's a, a few logical errors going on here. And we can see this if we go ahead and copy this into a chisel shell. We can go ahead and play around with this. We can see if I want to round ahead, let's say, first of all, let's try, let's try 17. And let's say the tick spacing is 10 and let's say it is zero for one. So I should go from 17 to 20. That's what I should go. But we actually go from 17 to 10. Now let's see, what if I try seven? So seven goes to zero. So we're in fact rounding backwards. Now what happens if false, if zero for one false? So I do want seven to go to zero here and it does. But for zero for one true, it doesn't. Let's see what happens with negative seven. We get zero and that's actually expected, that's good. But of course, if I say false, so we want it to go to negative 10, it still goes to zero. And then of course, if I go to 17, this should go to negative 20 and it goes to negative 10. But if I say true, this should go to negative 10, it goes to zero. So there's a lot of different issues <laughs> going on here with this round ahead function. And so the, the recommendation here is they need to account for a few different things, right? So first of all, if zero for one and either of these two things are true, then we need to actually move the tick spacing up. So let's copy and paste this in and we'll have a look and understand what this adjustment is doing. So we're replacing these two cases here with these lines here. So for the zero for one case, if the rounded tick is positive, which means that basically we're, we rounded it down, right? Because if, if our rounded tick is positive, we came from, for example, negative, we came from 17, we rounded it to the closest nearest thing. So we rounded it back to 10, the magnitude decreased. The magnitude when you round stuff off will always decrease. Well, we wanna go to the left because it's zero for one. So we gotta add, we gotta adjust up by the tick spacing. So if this is the case, we gotta adjust up by the tick spacing. Or if the rounded tick was zero and the tick before the rounding was greater than zero, then we gotta adjust up. So for example, if we had seven here, the rounded tick is zero and the original tick was greater than zero, so we gotta adjust up. If it was negative seven, however, the rounded tick is zero, but the original tick was negative seven. So we don't have to adjust up an additional time. We just wanna to go to zero. The same exact logic, just inversed for not zero for one. So let's go ahead and let's try out these modifications to our round ahead function. So let's try out round ahead. Let's try out seven with a tick spacing of 10 and zero for one true. So we expect this to go from seven to 10, right? And we go to 10. Let's try out 17. So 17 should go to 20. All right, there we go, we're at 20. Let's say two, two should go to 10. Okay, great. 
So let's try out negative 2. We don't want to go all the way to 10, we just want to stop at 0, and we get 0. Let's try negative 7. We get 0. Negative 17 should go to negative 10. That's great. And then let's try a 0 for 1 false. So negative 17 should go to negative 20. There we go. And we go to, from negative 7, should go to negative 10 for 0 for 1 false. Let's try maybe, let's try 0, something real weird, right? So this should just be 0, right? Because that's a rounded thing. So what is 0 for 1 true, say, for that? That works as well. Let's try some positive numbers with 0 for 1 false. We go 7. 7 goes to 0. That's good. 17 should go to 10. And there we have it. So this is the exact handling of all the cases that they need to cover just around this very simple rounding here. So you can you can easily tell that there's a lot of different complex edge cases that come up when you try to account for rounding, you try to build in the logic for truncation like this. So those were two examples of completely different findings that had to do with completely different systems that were both affected by this truncation logic and both had to deal with that extra added complexity. So now, of course, when you're doing your own security reviews and you encounter a division symbol ever, you need to think about truncation, right? Are they handling truncation the right way? Are they expecting truncation to occur? What can happen if I provide really small values? Can that get rounded off? And can that affect the system in some negative way or give me some advantage as the, the user? Or are they just handling you know, these truncated amounts completely wrong? or things like that. And definitely be sure to think about these edge cases of negative seven, if there's like some some negative number and it gets rounded, it doesn't actually round down in value, it rounds down in magnitude. So it rounds closer to zero if it's negative and it rounds closer to zero if it's positive. All right, so I hope that gave you a few ideas of things that you can start looking for in your own security reviews. And hopefully these findings were something new to you that you didn't see before. And perhaps you'll you know start to notice these things going forward. That is all for today. Of course, if you're really interested in Web3 security and really interested in getting to connect with others from across the world who are also interested in smart contract auditing, learning you know, really complex solidity issues and learning others approach to learning Web3 security, then of course, go ahead and submit an application to join our completely free community of smart contract security researchers at lab.guardianaudits.com. And I look forward to seeing you in there. All right, that is all for this time. And I hope to see you in the next one.